This joy. Not that joy. But this joy that we have. I wonder if somebody in the chat might just type joy. And you got to listen, you, you, you can't use lowercase. I need everybody to be all caps. Somebody just type joy. And, and, and if there's somebody in this place on this Sunday that's got some joy, somebody ought to just wave one of those streamers. If you've got joy deep down in your heart, somebody ought to shout joy. And Robert, you had it. If you've got joy in your spirit, somebody stand up and give God a hand clap of praise because this joy that we have, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. You may be seated. Let me just skip right to the end of the story and begin <laughs> with the end in mind. As one might expect, this Easter sermon is about resurrection. And resurrection is about joy. Amen. The joy of living, the joie de vie, Jesus, the resurrection and the life says, I came that you might have life and I've come to give you joy. So today we rejoice, we find our joy again because resurrection fulfills the promise of abundant life. Abundant life gives joy. Yes. Psalm 30 in verse 5 says it this way, weeping may endure for the night, but joy, it comes in the morning. Yes. Proverbs 10 and 28 puts it this way, the prospect of the righteous is joy. James chapter 1 verse 2 says it this way, I count it all joy, even when trials of every kind come my way. Philippians says it this way in chapter 2 verse 1, if there is any encouragement... In Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Yes. So with the completion of Christ's life work, therefore this resurrection sermon is about the joy of abundant life after death, the joy of Jesus. It's about joy. Joy, 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 joy. I love the creativity of black music. It's brilliant. Right, despite all of the shit the world has thrown at black people, we can still find our joy. We can experience black boy joy and black girl joy and black human joy and, and trans joy and, and, and joy in every shade, every color, every song. The joy of being trans on this day of visibility, we see you. And the church has been sure to sing this joy that we have. The world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. So don't let them take it. Let me just skip right to the end of the story and begin with the end in mind. As one might expect, this Easter sermon is about joy, the joy of resurrection. And because this Resurrection Sunday falls on the last day of Women's History Month, Women's Futures Month, I am compelled to turn to the voices of women and to listen to them. Let us listen to them and hear their stories because it was the women who came to the tomb early in the morning on the first day of the week while it was still dark. Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and Mary of Magdala, and she, Mary Magdalene, announced, I have seen the Savior. He is not dead. He is yet alive. Resurrection, therefore, is about the good news, according to St. Mary of Magdala. Yeah. Let's be clear, if it wasn't for the women, there would be no Easter. Although resurrection would have happened, there would not have been anyone around to tell that it had happened. Because what had happened was that the men, the brothers were still sleeping or were too damn scared or had some other lousy excuse for why they could not show up on time. 
Cheryl Townsend Gilks in her 2001 classic, If It Wasn't For The Women, Black Women's Experience and Womanist Culture in Church and the Community, it helps us to appreciate the significance of what God through Christ Jesus does on resurrection on Easter Sunday morning. You see, I'm so glad that he got up. But I'm convinced that we would not be singing he got up if she didn't tell it. I don't know who needs to hear me today, but I need you to hear this today. On this last day of March, Women's History Futures Month, I am compelled to take a feminist approach to Easter and to reclaim resurrection from the sexist framework that has left buried the story of Mary of Magdala in the tomb. Yeah. Although it was Mary who first went to the tomb. It was Mary who went to the tomb while it was still dark. It was Mary who ran off to tell the sleeping male disciples who couldn't stay woke. It was Mary who announced, I have seen the Lord, the teacher. Although the story of Easter literally begins and ends with Mary of Magdala. Somehow, Mary is sent backstage while Peter and Thomas and the other brothers take center stage. Somehow. No, 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 we know how. <laughs> Patriarchy is sinister. It's insidious. And it will literally try to erase. Even as women are still being sacrificed and crucified. M Mary said it first, but Peter and Thomas usually get all the credit in the telling of the Easter story, Peter's runs and doubting Thomas and on and on and on. We know the story. I'm sure every woman in this church today has experienced the type of sexism. When you say something at a meeting or a gathering and you're ignored, only for a man to steal what you said and then stupidly say it again. Yes. Certainly not as poetically and only then does the crowd take notice. One might say then that this Easter sermon is about the gaslighting of Mary Magdalene, <laughs> whose story has been relegated to a lesser part of Christian history, his story erasing her story. <laughs> this sermon is about the gaslighting of Mary Magdalene, whose story is relegated to a lesser part of Christian history, his story erasing her story. And this erasure begins in part because 6th century Pope Gregory the Great, the 64th Bishop of Rome, lied on Mary, delegitimized her, and her witness by labeling her a prostitute. Mary Magdalene, there, the history is, is clear. Mary Magdalene was neither a prostitute nor possessed by demons. This was simply patriarchy. It was an intentional smear campaign by male bishops. It still blows my mind that in some parts of the Christian church, the Roman Catholic Church and the, the Southern Baptist Convention in particular, the largest denominations in the Christian world still will not ordain women. I could not believe my eyes when I watched the video recording from last night's Easter Vigil at the Episcopal Cathedral on Boston Common when violent patriarchy and sexism was on full display. We're going to send you the tape. Reverend Tamara, the wife of our own executive pastor, Reverend Dr. Sarah, was celebrating the Eucharist during the Easter vigil at the cathedral as the church kept watch for the women to announce resurrection. And the presiding bishop, a man, literally stripped Reverend Tamara of her clergy collar in public. You can't make this stuff up. The male bishop tried to say that it was a joke and apologize in public, but it's no joking matter when a man publicly violates the personal space of a woman and symbolically strips her of her sign of ordination. 
Today we tell the good news. According to Mary Magdalene, although men tried to leave her true story behind. Because there's more to her story. And I suspect there is more to your story too. So today we're going to tell her story. And it's my prayer that by telling her story, you'll start telling more of your story, beloved. Yes, beloved, today is about telling more of the story of Easter. Today is about more, so much more. The ensemble just sang heaven down with more abundantly. Melodically interpreting the scripture recording in John chapter 10, verse 10, I've come that you might have life and have life more abundant. Following the sermon, the praise team will sing more than able. Our anchor song in 2024 at Union, the year of possibility, because yes, more than Abel melodically interprets the scripture recorded in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, God can do infinitely and immeasurably more than anything we can ask or imagine. God can do more exceedingly and abundantly more. Somebody ought to turn to their neighbor and just say more. In this light for the remaining moments, I want to reflect from the subtitle, So Much More in a World Full of Less. One might say that this Easter sermon more or less concerns itself with the narrow-mindedness and small thinking. This sermon is about how folks will try to steal your joy. Spoiler alert, don't let them. Still, this sermon confronts the scarcity mentality and the zero-sum attitude that is all too common today, the small mindset that would imprison us to a world of diminished possibilities. Let's be honest. Folks often don't want us to be great, don't want us to flourish. They want to take from us and, and limit and, and negate and reduce and cancel and cut off and short-circuit and try to define us by our extractive value. But resurrection is a historical event whose full story has yet to be told fully. So today we spend some time excavating some of the buried history of resurrection, since resurrection is both a historical event and it's also a present day reality when we excavate some of the buried history of resurrection, we might dig out some of our own buried stories aiding us to live out the resurrection principle today. Resurrection, it fulfills the promise of abundant life, liberating us, freeing us from captivity, captivity to an impoverished mindset, to a scarcity mentality. I want us to be able to apply that ancient resurrection principle of flourishing so that we might live the abundant life here and now. It's resurrection faith that draws us into expansiveness, into worlds of endless possibilities where our story, where the story of our life is still being written. The story of resurrection is still being written as we expand our possibilities, and we write our story in big letters. Because in order to see it out there, we've got to see it in here. And before we can see it in here, we must see it in here. So before we can see it, we must see it. Imagine that. This Easter sermon. This is about the gaslighting of Mary Magdalene who announced the resurrection of Jesus and it's also about what needs to be resurrected in us. Resurrection, here's the good news according to St. Mary Magdalene. Now we are familiar with the four gospels in our Bible, all of which are written by men. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
We are less familiar uh, with another gospel that also testifies to the good news of Jesus. This gospel was written not by a man, but rather by the same woman, the, the one who first announced, I have seen the Lord. The Gospel of Mary, although it dates to the same time period of the Gospels of Luke and Matthew, her gospel often is not read in churches, not taught in Sunday school. And the Gospel of Mary is mostly known only to scholars. Mary's gospel was lost for more than 1,500 years, and currently only three actual copies of the original text in the Greek and the Coptic uh, remain. And only in the last 20 years has there been a renewed engagement with Mary's gospel. After decades of painstaking research in, 20, in 2003, New Testament scholar Dr. Karen King published the gospel of uh, Mary, Magdala, Jane, Jesus, and the first woman apostle. Let me say that again. Turn to your neighbor and say, help him, Jesus. <laughs> Uh, Karen King published the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, Jesus, and the first woman apostle. And in 2019, one of King's students, Megan Watcherson, published Mary Magdalene revealed the first apostle, her feminist gospel, and the Christianity that we haven't tried yet. Mary Magdalene revealed the first apostle her feminist gospel, and the Christianity we haven't tried yet. You should know that, that former United Methodist Bishop Susan Hassinger, who led our New England conference from 1996 to 2004, was part of the New Orleans Council that published in 2013 the New New Testament that places the Gospel of Mary alongside of the Gospel of Thomas and other buried texts, places these recovered apocryphal, apocryphal meaning secret or hidden, buried text, they place in this new New Testament, a lot, where is my book? Listen. Right, the, the new New Testament. The new New Testament, it places the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of Thomas alongside the Gospels of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Scholars agree that some copies of Mary's gospel were accidentally lost over time, and many of these texts were intentionally buried through willful neglect because their messages were too radical for the early church. More to the point, Mary's gospel undermined the authority of early church teachers. Mary was a dangerous woman who said that she, because she had a special relationship with Jesus, that Jesus had given her a special teaching. She was deemed dangerous because her gospel challenged the power of men and the power of a male-dominated church. The most complete papyrus copy literally has the first pages with the first few chapters literally torn out while the others remain intact. Which is to say, it was not an accident. There wasn't a general deterioration of the text over time, but rather the provocative and special teaching, the prophetic teaching of Mary was too much for the early church so other copies were likely set on fire, such that the gaslighting of Mary is not mere rhetoric. Check it, our canonized gospel of Luke tells it this way. When they had returned from the tomb, the women told all the things to the eleven. And the others, and the women were Mary of Magdala and Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, the other women with them also told the apostles, but the story seemed like nonsense. And they refused to believe them. Mary's gospel says it even more directly, revealing Peter's insecure and bruised male ego. 
The Gospel of Mary, it says, Peter questioned the disciples about the Savior. Did Jesus really speak to a woman without our knowing it? Are we to turn around and all listen to her? Did he choose her over us? You see, Mary's gospel was deemed heretical and her female body labeled hysterical, emotionally excessive in favor of an orthodoxy that has continued from antiquity to the present. Don't you know that the history of hysteria from which we get the word hysterectomy concerns itself with the removal of the uterus and the removal of the female body and the removal of women's voices from the story. This erasure is a betrayal of the true Christianity that is first announced. I have seen the Lord. We must listen to the women because their countercultural witness might in fact be the only thing that can save us. Those women who were unafraid to journey in the dark. Those women who thought it important to care for the body of a broken Jesus. Those women who were unafraid to stand and weep. Because what they had had been lost. These bold prophetic Women, the, the community of women provides us a powerful alternative way of being in a world that valorizes authoritarianism of so-called strong men like Trump and Putin and Netanyahu. To be sure, such authoritarianism of strong men, it runs counter to the gospel. The community of women revealed that resurrection happens in community that it's not so much about the one, but the many. A true community is only as strong as its weakest member. A powerful way of resisting the urge we, we find in the good news, a powerful way of resisting the urge of the unchristian right which peddles, God bless, the USA Bibles and interprets Jesus as a triumphant strongman that upholds power and profit instead of portraying Jesus as he was. That humble, table-flipping, downwardly mobile, preferential option for the poor. Witness to the least and the loss. This is the, quote, false white gospel that Jim Wallace writes about in his new book to be released later this week on rejecting Christian nationalism, reclaiming true faith, and refounding our democracy. Because theologically speaking, resurrection is a democratic process that gives power to the people. Where infinity, once incarnate in the one, is then poured out the power that had been located in the one, in the incarnate Jesus, is poured out into the community. So by turning to the community of women, we see that resurrection, it lives in a community that comes alive. No longer is power located in the one, but in the many. No longer ought we look to the norm, the status quo, to what is prominent. Rather, we must turn to these hidden figures that have been hidden in plain sight. So I want us, I invite us to look elsewhere, to imagine otherwise, because what's going on in the here and now definitely ain't working. So let's listen to the women. They were the ones who first announced resurrection and were ignored. Let's hear the gospel of Mary. At verse 1, beginning in chapter 4. When the blessed one had said these things, he greeted them, saying, Peace be with you. Bear my peace within yourselves. Beware that no one leads you astray, saying, Look over here, or look over there. For the child 
of humanity is within you. Follow it. Those who seek it will find it. Go then and proclaim the good news of the realm. Do not lay down any rules beyond what I have determined for you, says Jesus, nor give a law like a lawgiver, lest you be confined by it. When Jesus had said this, he departed. We often refer to Jesus as the son of God. But in Mary's gospel comes through the child of humanity. And the child of humanity says divinity lies inside of you, each of you. And we need not await power to come from outside. The spark of divinity already dwells within you, within each of us. Perhaps the good news of, of Jesus Christ, according to Mary, is most provocative, most prophetic, most loving in chapter 3. And this is where I'll end. Those who have ears, let us hear the good news of Mary. And Peter said to Jesus, since you have explained everything to us, tell us one other thing. What is the sin of the world? And the Savior said, there is no sin. That is why the good came into your midst, coming to the good in which belongs to every nature in order to restore it to its root. The resurrection of Gospel of Mary reveals something for us today. Jesus' death is not a pathway for overcoming original sin because the gospel of Mary says it plainly. There is no sin. And there is nothing wrong with us. We don't begin our lives in some spiritual deficit that is buried by original sin. The most original thing about us is that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of the God who loves us into freedom and there is no sin. We begin in the good implanted within every fiber of our being. And because the good is implanted in every fiber of your good being, your good body, we are more than enough. You are good enough. Jesus' death defeats death once and for all, and in preaching Christ's gospel of liberation at Union, we have already concluded that when we speak of sin, we do not speak of a laundry list of things that thou shalt not do. Rather, sin means anything that separates us from the love of God. But Mary's good news advances the good news that we already knew even further. It advances further this gospel of liberation and it frees us to a way of thinking because there is no sin. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the good that comes into our midst, coming to the good that belongs to our every nature, it restores us to our root because there is nothing that can separate us from God's love. Yes, at times we feel disconnected and alienated, but God's love is so all-embracing, all-encompassing, so unconditional, so reckless, so amazing is God's grace that Mary is so bold to offer the words of Jesus and there is no sin. You are not a mistake and the mistakes that you have made do not define you because God makes no mistakes and there is no separation, only love. Yes, we feel separated sometimes. 
and that's real. But the truth of the matter is this. We are not alone. We are not sinful. We are not despised. We are not rejected. We are not less than. And we need not be ashamed. I wonder about the Christianity that could have been if Mary's gospel had made the cut. Maybe fewer of us would feel like damaged goods if we heard Mary's good news that the good came to meet us and meet the good in us. Maybe fewer of us would feel that, that, that God would, wasn't done with us yet and that our best days are not behind us. Maybe more of us would know that we are our best thing Maybe the inner critic in us would quiet down some and we'd get a bit more free from those internalized oppressions. I wonder about the Christianity that could flourish. If we weren't so obsessed with Augustine and Irenaeus and Tertullian and all of those early church fathers who were obsessed with sin. I wonder about the Christianity that might flourish if the early church mothers might take center stage and we might shine a spotlight on their stories. This is the Christianity that we have not tried yet, and we should try it. The kind that emerges when we refuse to allow the story of resurrection to be told without centering the stories of these resurrection women. Joanna, Mary, and Mary the mother of James. And I suspect that when we center these hidden stories of these hidden figures, we might center our own. Because there is so much more to our story. And God is not done with us yet. And who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Sin, it seems, is a bit overrated. Humans by nature are not sinful, awaiting redemption. There's so much more to your story. And our starting point isn't the negativity of original sin, buried in the grave. We begin in love. I wonder about the Christianity that we have not tried yet the one that says the good in you meets the good that comes in the world and is so bold to say that nothing can separate us because we are more than conquerors. So what will separate us from the love of God? or trouble, or calamity, or persecution, or hunger, or nakedness, or danger, or violence. Yes, in all things, we are more than conquerors because God has loved us. And we are certain that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that comes to us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the good news of Mary Magdalene. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks, God.